good evening, everyone. This is Claudia, and I'm very pleased to present the first HHT webinar from Basker and HHT and the lungs. It's a pleasure to see so many people already joining us. And we are very excited to start this uh, adventure together with our first webinar, the first of many. First of all, just some housekeeping rules for you. Uh, this webinar will be recorded. So please keep in mind that it will be available afterwards at baskerin.eu. If you're not familiar with our website, we kindly invite you to go and browse around. There's a lot of very useful information. If you have any questions, please do take a look at the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. That's the perfect place to place any questions where Christina Grabowski from HHC Germany and Rhea Bloom from our HHC community in the Netherlands will be very kind to forward them to our speakers today. We did receive your questions in the registration form and we have forwarded them and they will be answered already during the presentation. You can use the chat box for any other kind of communication or technical assistance, we'll be happy to assist you. And maybe you wanna already start just by popping in where you're from and send us a hello. We'd love to know how many people are joining us and where you're from. So first of all, just for those of you that maybe are not familiar with Basker, and we'd like to give you a little bit of a heads up of who we are, how we work. We're sure that a lot of you through your patient organizations or through other kinds of newsletters and communication from Vasco are already familiar, but it's never enough to tell you about this revolution in rare disease management. So first of all, what does ERN stand for? ERN stands for the Rare Multisystemic Vascular Disease European Reference Network. So there are 24 reference networks all across Europe that basically create a common denominator in a certain group of rare diseases. We are partnered with our cousins from HTA, DMSA, and PPL, and VASCA. HHG is part of this extraordinary community and that has 26 healthcare providers from all over Europe and seven affiliated partners covering 16 countries in Europe. Of course, partnering with them are also 70 patient organizations. So this is our community and what do we do? Basically the ERNs are a ambitious but very, very well-structured effort from the EU to create better cross-border care, better research, multi-centric uh, clinical trials, outcomes that can be better for the patients and for managing the disease. So we're looking at an improvement this huge revolution is, an, is all striving towards an improvement for the patient community. Now let's take a look and meet the wonderful experts from the HHT work group. We have experts, oops, sorry. We have experts from across Europe. Our team is made of Sophie de Pigiro, who is our chair. She's a pediatrician and a geneticist. Our co-chair is Elisabetta Buscarini from Italy. Uh, we have Annette, excuse me, from uh, Denmark and Carlos Sabba from Italy, Ulrich Schur from Germany and Hans-Jürgen Mager from the Netherlands. Clearly these are the leads. We all know that behind every great HHD center is a great team of experts. So behind each of them is the work of a wonderful team that takes care of the patients in their countries. Now, going forward, we also have working alongside and together with the clinicians, the EPAG community. This might be a word that not many of you are familiar with. An EPAG is a European Patient Advisory Group. And it's in our case for the HHT group, it's made up of 12 representatives from 11 different countries, two organizations that are community members and one new organization applying in 2021. If you take a look at the map of Europe, it's very exciting to see uh, that we really do cover most of Western Europe. And if any of you are connected from Eastern Europe as patient delegates or clinicians, do reach out because we would love to foster the creation of organizations where patients are not represented. So do write to vascarin.eu. The email is in the um, website and we'll reach out and we'd love to meet you. Those are the logos of our organizations. 
and you might want to get to know some of them better if you're in those countries. But right now, the most important thing after this small introduction is to introduce the stars of our evening and uh, let them present the, all the topics that uh, you're all really looking forward to hearing. So a special thank you to Dr. Hans-Jürgen Mager and Professor Marco Post from St. Antonio's Hospital in the Netherlands from the Dutch HHT Expertise Center. It's a pleasure having you. Thank you very much. We're all looking forward to all the things you will enlighten us on this evening. Um, hello, everyone. After this uh, kind words of uh, Claudia, I would like to uh, start a presentation, which I will do together with my colleague, Professor Dr. Marco Post. Uh, questions can uh, be asked uh, at the end of the, can be answered at the end of the presentation, but if, in, if there is a very important question, we can also answer them in between. Uh, so today we are going to give a presentation about HT and the lungs, um, and uh, more uh, more to say about lung localization of HT. Just a small. Uh, uh, to remember you, everyone, uh, you all know you have HHT. Uh, it's my, I think it's nice to, to know again or to recognize again how we get to the diagnosis of HHT. If we do not perform DNA tests or we cannot perform DNA tests or maybe the mutation is not known, we use the Curacao criteria as clinical criteria. Those are recurrent spontaneous nosebleeds, uh, mucocutaneous T-lung reactasis. Those are the red spots. Those are enlarged capillaries, which can bleed easily. Uh, abnormal vessels in all organs, and mostly they occur in the lungs, in the brain, or in the liver, and a first degree family member with definite HHT. So internationally, we talk about HHT, and many countries, for example, in the Netherlands, we also call it Rende Oster Weber disease. Rende Oster Weber disease, HHT, and most patients either have HHT type 1 or HHT type 2. If you have type 1, the mutation which causes the HHT is located on the gene that encodes for endoglin, which is on chromosome 9. If you have HHT type 2, HHT is caused by mutation in the ALK1 uh, gene, uh, which is located on chromosome 12. There must be there must be other uh, mutations, other genes which can lead to HT. We are internationally we are still looking for those, and we might uh, we have find possible locations of chromosome five and seven. And then finally, there is a rare uh, uh, syndrome, which is a combined syndrome of juvenile polyposis syndrome and HT, and that is caused by mutation on the SMOT4 gene on chromosome eighteen. So now. To the pulmonary arterial venous malformations. In this presentation, Marco and I will call it PAVMs. PAVMs are lung localization of HHT, and PAVMs are direct connection between the lung artery and the lung vein. Uh, and 80 to 90 percent of those uh, PAVM of PAVMs is related to HHT. What are the? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I go back. Uh, if you see here. This is the lung artery, it divides into small vessels and then into capillaries. The, those are around the alveoli, uh, where the oxygen up, uptake takes place, and then they go back into the pulmonary vein, to, to the lung vein. If you have HHT and a PFEM, you have a direct connection between the lung artery and the lung vein, which means that the blood which is going through this abnormal vessel, through this, this abnormal connection, is not going through the capillaries. And as a result, there will be no oxygen uptake here. And more important, small blood clots or bacteria that are normally trapped in this capillary network can pass through this abnormal connection. I come back to that later. So what are the symptoms <coughs> of this shunt? Because if the blood which is going through this abnormal connection, we call that a shunt. The symptoms of this right to left shunt of this shunt are low. If the uh, abnormal vessel is large, then you can get low oxygen, which causes short of breath or cyanosis, which means that you have blue lips, blue fingernails. It can also cause clubbing of the fingernails and sometimes migraine. Migraine occurs in about 40% uh, of patients with PAVMs, where in the normal uh, population, it's only about 15%. But, and that's most important, mostly, PAVMs go without symptoms until you get a complication. So that's the reason we screen 
for PFVMs because we want to prevent the complications. Back to migraine. Like I said, 12 to 15 percent of the population of people have migraine. Women have it four times often than men, and uh, mostly it's a headache which lasts for a few hours until a few days. It's single-sided. It's pulsing. Uh, people have to rest. They cannot uh, get light into their eyes, and they may have nausea. Um, and then you have migraine with aura. Uh, then the migraine goes with neurological symptoms. They are mostly, well, they're always subsequent. So not every all symptoms at once, like you have a stroke, but first the arm, for example, and then the leg. But mostly the neurological complaints are visual. Uh, patients see stars and all kinds of things. And uh, you can also get tingling in your fingers or around your mouth. Sometimes people have temporarily speaking problems or even a paralysis. And often these neurological complaints start before the headache. So what do we see? This is a normal distribution and people do not have a PFM, but if people have a PFM, they have a lot more migraine. And as you see, they have especially more migraine with aura, which is the white bar here. So migraine with aura, you see a lot more when people have a shunt, when people have HT patients have a PFM. <clears throat> this is another way to show this, uh, that PFMs are related with migraine with aura. The people with a small abnormal, abnormal vessel in the lung are light brown. The people with a large PFM with a large shunt, they are wet, they are white. And if you see, if you have a large PFM, many people, even more than 50% of people have migraine with aura. So, why do we screen for PFMs? We screen to minimize the risk of complications. And which complication do we fear most? It's this complication. And what you see here is an MRI scan of a brain of a patient who got a brain abscess. This is the region with the brain abscess due to an untreated large PFM in this patient. If you nowadays we screen and we treat PFM, so these data are a bit old data, but if we some time ago we investigated what are the complaints, what are the complications of people with untreated PFM, then we see hemoptesis coughing up blood in a few patients, one to two percent, blood in the thorax, uh, blood in the chest cavity, in about three percent of people. Brain abscess, we saw in 8%, and a T hour stroke, we even saw in 14%. So, how do we screen? Screening nowadays is much easier, uh, much easier, not only for the doctor, but especially for the patients, than we did it uh, 15 years ago, or 10, even 10 years ago, uh, 15 years ago. We start our screening with contrast echocardiography. We also make a chest x ray, but the most important tool for screening for PFEMs in adults is contrast echocardiography. And if we see a shunt on echocardiography, Marco Post will explain how we see that, then we perform a CT scan, a CT thorax, a low-dose CT scan. And on the basis of the CT scan, we can uh, see whether patients can be treated, whether the PFEM is large enough to treat, yes or no. For children, it's easier. We only do a chest X-ray and saturation measurements. We know that we will miss small PFMs in children by that way, but we uh, investigated that and we do not see uh, complications of PFMs when children have a normal saturation. So if the saturation is normal and if the chest X-ray is normal, there is no risk for a child to get a complication of a PFM and we postpone the contrast echocardiography, the screening, adult screening to 16 or 18 years old. So this is an example of a chest X-ray of a small child. Um, I think the child was about four years old when this picture, when this photo was taken. You here you see the heart, uh, and this is the left lung. This is the right lung. These are normal blood vessels, and here you see the ribs, but you also see white spots here, white dots. And this is a PFM. And from the side, it's a little bit difficult to see, but this here 
I can tell you is just too much. It's not normal. We made a low dose CT scan in this child. And then we saw the PFEM, this is the heart. And here we saw the PFEM in the left lung and he was treated subsequently. So now back to the screening, how we perform that in adults. And I will uh, ask uh, Marco Post to uh, talk about the screening with echocardiography. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Hans Jürgen. Sorry. Doesn't matter. Um, now here, how do we screen for pulmonary AVM? So we screen by echocardiography, uh, by uh, laying the patient down into the left, let, on the left lateral side, as you see on the uh, uh, photo. We use an intravenous line, uh, preferably in the uh, right, ante uh, right antecubital vein. We take one milliliter of blood uh, from the patient and we mix it with eight milliliters of uh, saline and one milliliter of air. In, um, and we mix it just to make micro bubbles and uh, uh, then inject it five milliliter of that uh, mixture uh, back into the patient. Next slide, please. And then you see uh, an image like this. Yeah, and maybe Hans Jurgen can point it that uh, on the left side, you see a lot of uh, whitening of the right ventricle. So that's a little bit strange. So on the left side, you see the right ventricle. So we uh, injected five milliliters of agitated saline, and that is uh, uh, directly uh, from the uh, antecubital vein into the right atrium and the right ventricle. And if you have an intact pulmonary capillary bed, you don't see any micro bubble on the left side, the left ventricle, and that's on the right side of the screen. Um, so here you can see a few micro bubbles uh, on a still frame in the left ventricle. So that's what I we call- again. Uh, yeah. So here you can see a few less than 30 micro bubbles in the left ventricle. And that's what we call the grade one uh, pulmonary shunt. So we try to grade the uh, amount of bubbles uh, on a still frame on the left ventricle. And then we divided it into a grade zero, of course, when there is no pulmonary shunt, grade one, if there's less than 30 micro bubbles, grade two, a moderate shunt, if there's 30 till 100 micro bubbles or a large shunt, more than 100 micro bubbles. And why is that important? Next slide. Uh, because we saw that the uh, amount of micro bubbles is related to uh, the complications Hans Jürgen told you. Here you see an example of a grade three pulmonary shunt. So you can see on the right side of the screen, the left ventricle, and that's as wide as the right ventricle. Now you see the right ventricle, and after a couple of seconds, you see that the left ventricle gets wide the same as the right ventricle. And that's what we called a grade three right to left shunt. And that's important because uh, the presence of a shunt gives an indication for prophylactic use of antibiotics before non-sterile procedures. And why? Next slide. We, col we correlated the uh, grade degrading system of the uh, transthoracic echocardiography with the presence of pulmonary AVMs on the formerly gold standard CT of the chest. And what did we found? We found that in HHT type one, next slide, please. Here you see the PFMs, a large one, a small one, and here also a very small one. And what did we see? Uh, we saw that if you uh, only look at the CT scan of the chest, um, you see in almost 62% of patients suffering HHT type 1, a pulmonary 
AVM. And in 10% of the patients, in the patients with HHD type 2. However, when you measure it with the transthoracic echocardiography, you see that in 85% of the patients with HHD type 1, the pulmonary shunt is diagnosed. Um, and in 42% of the patients with HHD type 2. And furthermore, if oh. you... No, 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 that, that's okay, that's okay. If you look to the uh, percentage of patients without a shunt on the left side uh, and look to the uh, presence on the, on the chest CT, you see that in grade three patients, so that's on the right side, almost all patients have a visible PAVM on uh, the chest CT. Next slide. And more important, if you have no shunt, that's the uh, left side of the figure, or a grade one shunt, you don't see any treatable PAVM on chest CT. So nowadays, we skipped the uh, chest CT when we diagnosed no or a small shunt during transthoracic echocardiography, and we only perform a CT scan after a grade two or a grade two, three uh, pulmonary AVM on echocardiography. Furthermore, these are data uh, also from the Italian group. We saw that the uh, grade of the pulmonary shunt by echocardiography is related to the complication rate. So on the left side, you see no right to left shunt. On the X uh, and grade one right to left shunt, you see just uh, a few patients suffering a complication, uh, a cerebral uh, a complication like stroke, TIA, or brain abscess. However, on the right side, if you have a grade three right to left shunt, you see that more than 20% of those patients suffered a cerebral complication if untreated. Next. And here you can see an example of a large pulmonary AVM. And a small one. And a small one. Okay. No. So now I will stop sharing my screen for a moment and Natasha Barr will uh, show you a small movie, a few minutes about screening procedure, how it takes place in, uh, in our hospital. I will explain now in the next uh, slides and then afterwards uh, we have time for a lot of questions. Um, so what when do we treat pulmonary AVMs? We treat them if we can treat them, which means that if the diameter of the feeding vessel is large enough, the, 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 the intervention radiologist will go into the lung artery with a catheter, try to find uh, the abnormal uh, vessel, try to find the PAVM, and he or she will close it with either coils or with a plug. I will show that later. Of the first procedure, the success rate is about 70-75% based on a six months follow-up CT. And if the PFM is not yet completely closed, uh, we can uh, do another procedure to close other feeding vessels or put another plug into it or whatever. What is important to know that even if you have been treated for your PFM and even if it's closed completely, the indication for prophylactic use of antibiotics before non-sterile procedures um, remains. And that's because we do not know if the PFEM will open up again in, let's say, a few years' time. So the indication for prophylactic use of antibiotics always remains, even if you have been treated for your PFEM. So this is an example of a coil. Uh, if it comes out of the catheter, it, it curls, and this coil uh, will stay in the vessel and this coil together with the clot which forms around this coil uh, forms the plug which closes the vessel. We also use a kind of plug. If you see this, you don't see a plug, you see a kind of cage. But within this cage, there will uh, come a, a clot and the cage together with, together with, the, with the clot 
forms the plug which closes the vessel. This is how it looks like if you go in with the catheter in the through the pulmonary artery, and here is a large PFM. And this is how it looks after the procedure. This PFM had several feeding vessels, uh, which are close to both the plugs. Here, these are the plugs. This is how they look like on uh, fluoroscopy, and these is a nest of different coils. This is another example: large PFM. Here's the catheter. And this large PFVM is closed with only one plug because it was a simple PFVM with only one feeder. Then at six months times, sometimes here you see the plug, there is still a vessel visible. Uh, so, sorry, do it again. So if you look here, this is the plug, but after the, this behind the plug, there was still a remaining, remaining sec of the PFM. So we performed the angiogram and then we saw there is no perfusion anymore from the PFM through the pulmonary artery. So from the pulmonary artery side, the PFM has been closed completely, but still we saw a remain of the remains of the sec on the CT scan. So the PFM is still there, but there is no perfusion. There's no blood coming into the PFM from the pulmonary artery. How is that possible? Well, that is possible because sometimes PFVM are not only feeded by the lung artery, but they are also feeded from vessels which, which, come, which come from the aorta, which is the main uh, artery in your body. So sometimes these branches of, there are branches going from the aorta going to the PFVM. So if the PFVM remains and there is no perfusion, no blood coming into the PFVM from the lung artery, then we perform an angiography where we are going to look for such feeding vessels originating from the aorta. In this case, there was a feeding vessel originating from the aorta, which was closed as well. We call that perfusion of PFVM from bronchial artery or from systemic circulation. So before we go to the questions, um, I think there are a few very important take home messages. Uh, the reason we screen for PFEMs is to prevent serious complications. And the most serious complications are stroke or brain abscess. All PFEMs should be treated if technical possible, which means if the diameter of the feeding vessel is more than two or more than three millimeter, they should be treated. If a PFEM persists six months after embolization, and we see that on the CT scan, then we perform additional embolization. PFEMs uh, are associated with migraine with aura, and we know that if we treat patients for their PFEMs, that they have less complaints of migraine with aura. We did a study some years ago, and then we found that uh, about 40% of patients with PFEMs had migraine with aura. And if you treated them, then only 18, 15 to 18% of the patients still had migraine, which is only slightly more than normal population. Very important if you have a PFEM, or even if a PFEM is not excluded, is that people should use prophylactic antibiotics before non-sterile procedures like, like a molar extraction by a dentist. That's really important because even if you have PFEMs left, which are not treated, you can prevent a brain abscess by using antibiotics before non-sterile procedures. So now I think it's time for, for questions. Thank you so very I'll much. sharing my screen then. Yes. Thank you very much, Hans Jürgen. And we have Christina and Bria. Um, if you'd like to turn on your cameras and deliver, I see some questions already popping in. Thank you very much for doing this. First question to the film. Um, the question is: It is always if it is always hereditary. One of the parents of the girl in the YouTube uh, video must also have ROV, right? That is a good question. Indeed, HD is a heritable disease, which means that if a child has the HD, almost 
uh, always, almost always, one of the parents will also have HD. Now and then we uh, have a child who has HD and the parents do not have HD. Of course, it could be a child of the neighbor, but very often that's not the case because we found a completely new mutation. And that's due to the fact that probably, especially in the endoglin gene, uh, is easy to get mutated. But those are the, are the exceptions. So normally, uh, if one of the parents has HHD, every child has a 50% chance of getting HHD. Okay. So there's another one. Um, can PABMs be di diagnosed on a um, echocardiography without bubble? Marco? Uh, no. No, we need the bubbles uh, um, and the PAVM cannot be diagnosed directly. We only diagnose the presence of a pulmonary shunt. And then we, uh, we perform, uh, as I told, a CT scan to diagnose a pulmonary AVM only in case of a grade two or a grade three. So you can't diagnose a pulmonary shunt without contrast. Okay, um, another one, the next one is, do you recommend further screening after initial negative tests? That is a very good question. Uh, as for the moment, uh, if a patient has a negative echo bubble, we repeat the screening uh, after five years. And that is because we know that PFEMs can develop in time. It is, but we think that when a patient is 60 years, uh, 55, 65, we don't know, uh, and still no shunt, then we think that the chance of that this patient will develop a PFEM uh, is very, very small. So we that's what we are going to investigate, whether we can stop this repeat screening at, for example, the age of 60. Mm -hmm. Ria, do you have any questions on your side? Um, there are more questions. Um, do you recommend further screening after initial? Oh, sorry, that was already us. <laughs> um, uh, someone is say, uh, says, uh, nice talk. And then are PAVM congenital or can they form in teenagers or adults? Um, probably mostly congenital, uh, but they can maybe they can form on later age as well. And that's the reason we do repeat screening after five years. But it is very good, very well possible that, for example, a child has very small PVMs, which might even not be visible on CT scan. And that with, with growing older, uh, the not visible ones will become visible. Because if you do not treat a PVM, it will slowly, slowly increases uh, in uh, get bigger uh, with increasing age. Okay, then there's another question. Are there also possibilities for coiling uh, AVM in the liver? Um, the answer is yes and no. Yes, technically it's, uh, it's possible. Um, as far as I know, there's only one center in the world where, where they do that. And why are we reluctant to do so? Because if the coiling in the liver can lead to liver necrosis, so that the liver will die because of lack of blood, lack of oxygen. That does not happen in the lungs because the lungs can always also get blood from the aorta, as I showed in one of the, uh, the pictures. So embolization of liver AVM, uh, we do not do that uh because it's very dangerous and in the international guidelines it also says that you should not treat uh, a pf a liver avm with embolization because uh, uh it's too dangerous and people can be uh, can die or need urgent uh, transplantation uh so that that's that's a big problem uh we, we that's the reason that in the international guidelines it's either treatment with medication and if you cannot treat with medication uh, then you patient has to go for liver transplantation okay um then there's another question hello if no shunt is determined 
in the lungs, what is the period of investigation? It used to be five years. Uh, so, sorry, say, say it again. Uh, if no shunt is determined in the lungs, what is the period of the next investigation? It used to be five years. It used to be five years. Uh, at the moment, we think it's safe to postpone to 10 years. Um, and um, I think that in future, uh, but we do not have all the data yet. I think in future, we will, uh, we will increase uh, the time to 10 years and maybe even stop at, for example, the age of 60, for example. Uh, but we are going to investigate that in the next years. Um, is it necessary to test all children on having HHD when a parent has HHD? What is the risk when parents decide not to test their children? So it's two questions. I will answer this question and the next question is for Marco. <laughs> uh, but uh, yes, it's, it's very important that parents have their children screened because every child has a 50% chance of getting uh, HHD. So the screening of a child you can do on different, different methods. You can start with DNA testing and if the DNA testing is negative, you, then the child does not need any more research. In the Netherlands, we very often have, patients, have parents who say we wait with the DNA testing until the child can decide for him or herself. Uh, but for the moment, we just want to know if he or she if the child has a PFEM that we should treat uh, on child age. And I think that's very important because I have seen children with large PFEMs uh, which really needed treatment uh, and they were at risk for getting a brain abscess, for example, without knowing themselves. And we know from, uh, from, from, from the literature, from other cases that also children can develop complications of PFEMs if the PFEMs are large. Uh, so yes, it's, I really would urge parents with HHD to have their children screened. If they do not want to know for their ch children yet if they have uh, HHD, yes or no, then at least perform screening for PFEM. Okay. Thank you. Um, is tattooing also considered a non-sterile procedure? In, I don't... I, uh, yeah. I don't think if it's uh, connected that's, to... Marco knows everything about tattooing. Oh. <laughs> and that's a very popular question in the patient community. So thank you to whoever okay. asked that. It'll be valuable for many. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's also a difficult question. But in if you look to the cardiology guidelines uh, for endocarditis prophylaxis, it's not uh, necessary to take antibiotics prior to tattooing. But there is another reason why I um, suggest patients with HHD not to get a tattoo, uh, or at least not a large tattoo. And the reason for that is that the, the T-lung reactasis, the red spots on the skin, prefer uh, to come into a place where there is uh, damage of the skin. And with tattooing, uh, you are damaging the skin. So uh, that's another reason not to, uh, to do tattooing in, in HT, because if you are damaging the skin with tattooing, those might be the place where you will develop uh, T-lung reactasis. It's very interesting, very interesting. I'm sure it will be useful to many of our young followers, maybe not only them. Ria, do you have any other questions? Uh, yes, if there are bubbles in the echo, but not no PAVM in the CT, do I have to take the uh, antibiotic prophylax? The uh, quick answer is yes. Yeah, so uh, any, any shunt grade, uh, uh, we advise to take antibiotic prophylaxis in non-sterile uh, uh, surgery or, and that's mainly in the, uh, with the dentist. So indeed, it's a good question because now and then we have patients who have a great three shunt, but we don't see macroscopic, we don't see PFEMs uh, on the CT scan. 
So this means that those patients have many, many, many uh, microscopic shunts, which you do not see on the CT scan, but they are there. And if uh, bubbles can go through the, uh, through the pulmonary uh, vessels, uh, bacteria can as well, because those bubbles are larger than the, than the bacteria. So yes, if you have a shunt, but even if you don't, do not see PFEMs on the CT, you still need to take antibiotics before non sterile procedures. Okay, um, then the next question is, um, hi, after a PAVM embolized, what are the chances of that PAVM to reopen to create the shunt again? We do not know exactly, uh, so I cannot say whether the chance is, uh, is 5% or 3% or 15%. And it depends on the case, it depends on the PFEM because there are, I made this, the, the presentation a little bit simple, but PFEMs can have one feeder, they can have uh, three feeders, but they can also have microscopic feeding. And especially the microscopic feeding can become larger with increasing age. So if you have a simple one feeder PFEM and it's closed after six months, then there is a good chance that it will never open again. But if you have a complex PFEM with multiple feeders, then there is a chance that it will at some time open again. And that's the reason that you that patients stay under control. Okay, thank you. There's a question about the coiling in the liver. If you cannot place a coil in the liver, uh, can the patient with uh, liver AVM con, uh, come on a list for liver transplantation before it is too life threatening? Well, maybe th this is a nice topic for another webinar uh, because now we have, are talking about HT in the lungs, but nevertheless, I can answer the question. Uh, and it's a good question. So every recognized HHT center knows uh, what the strategy sh should be with. Uh, uh, AVMs in the liver and nowadays we have defined the strategy within our international guidelines which we did not have uh, on liver AVMs uh, let's, let's say five years ago um, and every HT center they know how they could start uh, treatment with for example bevacizumab and uh, if that's not possible or the AVMs are too large or they, they do not react on the treatment, uh, then liver transplantation is the next option indeed. Yeah. I Before we go ahead with the questions, I would like to take, because I see questions coming in on other topics, use the chat box, not the Q&A, to tell us what the next topics you would like we handle in the next webinars, because we will be planning more. So we'll keep an answering questions. But if there's other topics you would like us to create a webinar around, please do tell us in the chat. And we'll take that into consideration, Ria. OK. Um, then there's a question. Can PAVM develop in midlife, or are we born with them? And that was already asked, I think. Yeah. But the, quest the answer was that we are born with it most of the we time. We are mostly born with it. And sometimes at birth uh, or child age, they can be very, very small that you don't see them. But with increasing age, they will enlarge, they become bigger, and then at some point you will see them. But we also have small children who already have large uh, PFEMs. And then, of course, the adult with no shunt, uh, yes, he or she can develop a shunt. Whether you will develop uh, a treatable PFEM if you do not have a shunt uh, when you are 20 years old, we do not know yet. Theoretically, it's possible, and it might be a few cases where that happens, but the chance is not so very uh, big. But still, a repeat screening is, is, is yeah, advised, uh, because even if you cannot treat a very small PFEM, you know at least that you have to take antibiotics before uh, non-sterile procedures. Ria, can I step in? There was a question that had come through in registration that was very interesting. There was a person who was mentioning that their SATs are at 35% and they were wondering if they were eligible for a lung transplant and if that is actually possible. Yes. As far as I am aware, uh, we did not do lung transplantation yet. Um, 
but we have considered it in a few cases with very severe diffuse PFMs. And it might be that in the literature there has been performed one or two, but I'm not sure. So it's certainly not a regular uh, thing to do. Uh, and mostly it's, it's not, not indicated, not needed. Okay. Brian, do you have any more? Uh, yes, or Chris they keep on coming. <laughs> yeah, okay. Christina, also, if you have any questions that you're monitoring. <laughs> yeah, I have some left, but we have first. <laughs> So. Okay. Um, in the Netherlands, is closing of shunts performed in multiple cent multiple centers, or is it concentrated in to a single center? It's uh, concentrated in the in the HST center, and we in the Netherlands we have one official HST center, and we are at the process of uh, making <laughs> or we say that, uh, establishing a satellite center, um, but. Even from there, the patients with PFMs come to Nieuwegein. But the Netherlands, of course, is a small country. Thank you. Uh, what is the status of stem cell investigation? Is it possible helping the veins to get stronger? Um, that's an interesting question, which is difficult to answer in just uh, a, few, a few sentences. What I can say about it is that we use stem cell research uh, together with the team of uh, Professor Mummery and uh, Frank Lebrun and Marie-José Gaumans in uh, Leiden Universal Med Medical Center. <clears throat> we collaborate closely already for more than 15 years and they are very, very far in stem cell research. And on the basis of stem cell research, we made uh, like I, you can say HT models uh, in the laboratory and these models uh, and they also have mice with HHT but these models you can also use for uh, research on medication and that's exactly what we are uh, doing uh, that we are doing nowadays it'll be interesting to hear how that develops we're all it's looking at the future yes. and actually we could consider thank you for this question from the public we could consider a webinar just on the future, where what we're looking at, at the very new technologies and procedures that uh, might not look like something for today, but in the near future. Christina, do you have any questions? We're, you're on mute. <laughs> so no one, hopefully to hear. Um, I've got one question which reached me on, on the WhatsApp uh, channel. Why is it so important to check the lungs before pregnancy? And can we do anything about it during the pregnancy? The reason it's important is that we have seen uh, that complications during pregnancy, but more during delivery, uh, do occur with, uh, in women without, uh, with uh, untreated PFMs. So, um, and that has to do, uh, is caused by the fact that during pregnancy, the, 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 heart action, the heart action is much more than without pregnancy and much more blood is flowing through your body and also flowing through the PFMs, which can cause uh, problems. Um, and we do know that if we treat women with PFM before delivery, then the risk of complications uh, decreases a lot. Um, so for that reason, we advise uh, women to have themselves screened and treated if necessary before pregnancy. If that's not the case, uh, then we perform the screening uh, and treatment uh, in the second or beginning of the third tri trimester, at least after 12 weeks. Okay. Um, the next one is I'm diagnosed with HHD, but do not have spirometasia on my hands, mouth, and do not have nosebleeds. Is this common? My HHD was found after a PABM was diagnosed. It's That's quite important for a lot of people, I think. And how, the, if the, the one who asked this question is adult, <clears throat> then it's rare. So if we see for nosebleeds, 90-95% uh, of patients have nosebleeds. And if we see for T-lung diectasis, it's the same, 95% of patients have T-lung diectasis. So indeed, not 100% of HT patients have T-lung diectasis and nosebleeds. So it's possible. 
but having a PFEM and no T lung diectasis and no nose bleeds is rare. But having said so, uh, I have a, quite some patients who do have PFEMs but do not have nose bleeds. And they think they do not have T-lung diectasis, but if you look very carefully, for example, with a microscope to the nail folds, you do see the T-lung diectasis. And if the ENT physician uses a microscope in the nose, he will probably also see microscopic T-lung diectasis. Okay. We do have two more minutes for, I know there are some questions we won't be able to answer, but we will take them in, uh, they're on different topics. We'll keep them in mind and note them down for the different uh, issues. I do see one last question. Am I correct? Yeah, um, but this one is right. There is, a, it's all on embolization. So yeah. embolization is fascinating for everyone because clearly we think, we know it's so successful for the lungs. And one of the questions is where else can we do it? And the major question is, can we do embolization in the nose? I know it's not an, a knee and T session, but just because we did answer liver, maybe we could mention if it is practiced also in the nose. Um, before I go to the nose, I want to add maybe a question which I have seen when preparing the webinar uh, that PFEMs are uh, large vessels. And I saw a question whether PFMs cannot be treated with medication. Um, that is not the case because the medication we know only will probably only do something on the small vessels where you can probably still reverse the abnormalities. But if you already have a large vessel like a PFEM, then it's unlikely that this will reverse to a normal vessel with just medication. Uh, back to the nose. Yes. Technically, uh, embolization of arteries in the nose is feasible. It's not recommended to do it uh, regularly because there can be very, very severe side effects. For example, blindness at one eye. Um, having said so, we now and then do that in our center, but it's really, like I say, a back against the wall situation. And I have to say, in this back against the wall situation, some people uh, have a very good reaction to it, but mostly only temporarily. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Ria, you do have another question? Maybe we can take one last one, go ahead. <laughs> well, I thought uh, this is quite interesting because a lot of people ask for that. Um, is, is it possible to uh, repair the gene defect uh, I think the right answer here should be not yet. <laughs> uh, and also, this is a topic where you can uh, organize a webinar. Uh, but in the last uh, HD conference, which was 2019, uh, we had a very interesting story about gene therapy, uh, which now has been uh, developed for uh, a specific kind of hemophilia. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are many, many problems with gene therapy. Uh, it's not now this right session to, to go into that much deeper, uh, but it might be that in future, uh, maybe for a selection of patients, it could be an option, but it's, it's still far away. I agree with Hans Jürgen. This is, we'll have a webinar on what the futures of science holds. And because, Ria, thank you, that's true. So many people write to us as patient organizations asking that same question. So I think we, I would like to also thank the people who have made suggestions. Liver is a big topic that they would love to hear about in the next webinars and nosebleeds, clearly that is a must. And uh, we know that's our, one of our most daily struggles. So time is up for today, but everybody has stayed online up to the last minute. I know you would stay more, but we'll be back very soon. And before we leave you, we would like to thank the entire Vascarin team on behalf of the HHT group, Natasha, Ibrahim, Karen, everyone who has worked so much in the background to make this happen. And of course, my colleagues, EPAGs, uh, Ria and, and Christina, who have accompanied me, but most of all, our speakers. It's always enlightening to listen to you, Dr. Maget, Dr. Post. We're very happy to have had this afternoon together and looking forward to the next ones. Thank you all very much for being here and our public, you were the most special part of this. Make sure you stay tuned with the Facebook page of Baskern, our newsletters, and you will see more appointments coming soon.
for, from HHT Workgroup in Baskern. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Claudia. It was, was a pleasure to do. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.